in Hebrews chapter 1, the Bible says, God who at sundry times, which means various times in various ways, has spoken times past, but in these last days, he has spoken through his son. And it, and it goes on to say that God's son is the radiance of God's glory, and he revealed himself. And he died for our sins, and then he rose again as it's seated at the right hand of God. And so we're going to focus on what it means. Easter Sunday. What it means. The resurrection truly means that I was drawn to a scripture verse that I would never think. I think I'm the only pastor in America that is probably preaching from Psalm 130 today. But uh, I, you'll understand why. Because what does the resurrection mean? What does it mean? And I think this passage really gets at what the resurrection means to you and to me. So if you would like to stand and, and read God's Word uh, with me, uh, you're welcome to. It's going to be on the screen in verse 1. Uh, you can read it with me if you'd like. You can read it out loud or you can read it silently. I'm going to start with verse 1. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in His word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. Yes, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with Him is abundant redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all our iniquities. Thank you. This is the word of God. And it's so good to hear it. You may be seated. So why in the world, Pastor John, did you choose this verse? What in the world are you thinking, Pastor John, in, in sharing this verse? Well, here's what I'm thinking. This morning, maybe you have experienced some darkness. This morning, maybe you have experienced the depths of sin. Maybe you have experienced sin that has shackled you and weighed you down. Maybe you have experienced the depths of death. Maybe you have experienced heartache and sorrow. And, and all of us have experienced in some way, shape, or form this sense of depth. The sense of being in a dark hole. The sense of, of being in a place where you don't know how in the world you got there, but there you are, and you don't know how in the world you're going to get out of it. it, it can I hear an amen? amen. I mean, I, I don't really have to go, because you already have gone. Okay, this is where I've experienced darkness. This is where I have feel like I have fallen. And I can relate to this cry. Out of the depths of my hurt, out of the depths of my heartache, out of the depths of the shackles that I am experiencing, out of the depths of th this deep, dark hole, I cry to you. I cry to you. Oh, Lord, hear my cry. And I, I just want to share with you uh, three things that come out quickly. There's three things that come out of this sense of uh, being in a dark hole. The first thing is you feel powerless. The loss of power. You, you, when, when we're in the depths, we look up and we see no way out. We just see a dark hole that we're in. And we try to get out of it, but we just, uh, just feel powerless to get out of it. There's things that are in your life that are controlling you. You and you just don't see how you can get out of it. The second thing is this loss of hope. This loss of it's hopelessness. Your dreams have been shattered. And you feel shackled by your present circumstances and situations. That, that dream, that, that future, what you thought was there before you. When you got married, when you had children. You're like, where did those dreams go? I mean, I had it all planned out. And I feel so hopeless now. 
I, I don't feel any hope for the future. I'm stuck. Have you felt that way before? The third thing that you feel is this loss of life or this loss of your, yourself. You just think in the midst of all your troubles, you've lost who you are. You've lost your sense of esteem. You just feel like you're worthless and powerless and helpless. And, and, and you're, you're feeling lonely. You're feeling isolated. The worst part, it's, that's the worst part of this is you just don't feel like anybody understands. Anybody really gets who you are. And, and you just, uh, it's not that things are going bad. You've come to the place where you think you are bad. Almost that you do deserve what you get. And, and that's what depths can, if you're too deep, that's what can, you can get swallowed up in these depths. And so, this is where he is. Out of the depths of darkness and depression, I'm crying to you. Out of the depths of sin and shame, I'm crying to you. Out of the depths of my heartache and my loss, I'm crying to you. Out of the depths of my loneliness and my isolation, I am crying out to you. Out of the depths, I cry to you. I love how real Scripture is. I love that the Bible doesn't dismiss our pain, our heartache, our suffering. But in the midst of that, hope shines. In the midst of that, a light burns that we may not see or understand at the moment. But there is hope that is there for the taking. But verse 2, he goes on to say, Lord, I've cried to you, hear my voice. It's almost like there's, a, Lord, I, I know maybe you've, I've cried to you and maybe you've heard me. But Lord, if you've heard me, would you just be attentive to my cry? Would you turn towards me? Would you face me? Would you, it's almost like the psalmist is grabbing the Lord and saying, hey, would you just face me? I, I, need, I need to see you. I need a relationship with you. I don't need to serve an idea, a thought, a religion, or a concept. I need a relationship with God, my Father. Would you attend to my cry? Did you catch the, the progression there? I'm crying. Hear my cry and just turn, be attentive. Pay attention. Oh, now, Lord, I've got your attention. But you know, what I want you to understand is you're not alone. Have you ever, I call them ping pong prayers. You feel like your prayers are just bouncing off the wall. You know, have you ever felt that way? It's a boing. All right, you're not hearing me. You know how real this is? This is right in the Bible. He's, he's saying exactly what you have felt. And he is giving you permission to come to that place where you're like, Lord, I, I'm, I'm right there. I'm here. I want, I'm crying out to you and I'm asking you to be attentive to my cry and pay attention to me. So, so what's this got to do with Easter? What's this got to do? So just imagine, would you please, a moment where there's a very, very dark night. It's that kind of darkness that you feel like you can cut with a knife. I, I remember when I was a child and I was at camp and I woke up and I couldn't see one sliver of light. Have you ever? I, I was so scared. Have you ever been there? Or you did, there was not one slither of light to be seen. And, and you, you're disoriented. You don't, don't know. that It's that kind of darkness. Imagine that kind of darkness that takes your breath away. And, and, and actually kind of seeps into your, your being. Uh, your whole life seems to be unraveling because all your hopes and dreams have been shattered as you've watched. Jesus being taken from you, dragged away like a sheep to the slaughter. The one, the Messiah, the, the, the one you've hoped and dreamed would rise up as the new king of David. And he's been dragged away. And he's been beaten. He's been hung up on a criminal's cross. And you saw the anguish on his face 
when that dark, dark Friday afternoon and the thunder was clapping and the darkness was rolling in and he said, it is finished. And here you are in the midst of that darkness. Imagine you're Peter. Imagine you're Peter who stood, who was with Jesus and said to Jesus, on Thursday, the night that he was betrayed, I will never betray you. I will never deny you. It won't be me. And then he sees Jesus dragged away. And he is before a young teenage servant girl. And he sa she says, hmm, I think I know you. I think you're with the one. And he says, I do not know him. I am not one of his. He was cowering before a teenage servant girl. Someone said, I think it was a, um, a Shakespearean play that, that said it this way, a coward dies a thousand deaths a thousand times before his death, but a valiant taste of death but once. And here he is, he's dying a thousand deaths. He's, he denies Jesus not just once, not just twice, but here he is warming himself beside a devil's fire. And someone says, hey, aren't you with him? I think I saw you in the garden. And you know what he says? I don't know him. Can you imagine how Peter felt? I, I just thought to myself uh, about Judas' kiss. At least Judas acknowledged Jesus, you know? I mean, which one is worse? If you think about it, Judas' kiss, at least he acknowledged. And it only happened once. And here's Peter once, twice, three. And he, and he denies Jesus. And, and can you imagine how he felt inside? And here we are. We all feel like I deserve what I'm in. I've made a mess of things. I have no hope. Darkness has come upon me. I have no sense of power. I can't change things. And I feel like I'm losing myself. I feel like in the midst of all this, I've lost who I really am. And darkness comes. So what does the resurrection mean? Well... Martin Luther called this uh, a, Paul, a psalm from Paul. And you see where, where he gets this in verse 4. Because he goes on in verse 4 and says this. But, oh, I mean verse 3. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Okay, if you're like doing the check marks of all the things I've done wrong, if you're marking them, oh, there goes another one. Okay, I mean, that whole sheet would be black. And who could stand before uh, your inquisition? It, it, I mean, I could, I would wither if you, uh, if I stood before you, Lord. And he goes on to, to say in verse 4, but there is forgiveness with you. Can't you imagine Peter almost saying this? Lord, I have messed up so much. I, I, I mean, I denied you and denied you and denied you. And I, I was a coward before you. How in the world could you receive me? But if you marked my iniquities, little Lord, who could stand? And then here's the risen Lord Jesus. And here he is fishing. And here, here Jesus is at the, at the edge of the sea. And, and, and Peter sees him. And his heart skips. And he doesn't even wait. He, he jumps in the water and he starts swimming after Jesus in John chapter 21. And Jesus is there fixing him some fish. You know? The risen Lord Jesus. <laughs> And, and here's Peter. Peter says, you know, uh, just eating and just, just realizing how he had denied Jesus. But here he is alive and he has hope now. There's a light that is shining in his heart. And Peter looks at him and says, hey, do you love me? And there was something in Peter's heart 
that a light that just started burning, a hope, a, a sense of power and authority. And he said, yes, I love you. Then feed my sheep. You know what? Jesus not only did it once, but you know what he, he said? Do you really love me? Yes, I love you. Then he said a third, third time, Peter, do you really love me? Now, how many times did Peter deny? Three. How many times did Peter say, I love you? Jesus did that just for Peter. And he'll shed the light of grace and love and mercy on you. If you'll just come running to him. If you just open up and let that light shine in the midst of him. Can't you, this is, this is Peter saying, oh, if you were to mark my sins, I, I couldn't stand. But with you, with you there is forgiveness. There's, with, there's forgiveness with you. Therefore, you may be feared, honored. You, you've captured my heart. I, I have such reverence for you now that my whole life is turned toward you. And here's what I want you to get. Here's the first thing. The resurrection lifts up us out of the pit by awakening faith. In the midst of our sense of powerlessness, he awakens faith in our heart. The resurrection awakens faith in our heart. That death is not the final answer. Life is. Hope is. Joy is. And that's why I love Hebrews chapter 3. It says, He's the brightness of the glory. He upholds everything by the word of his power. And when he purged his sins, he sat down at the right, right hand of God with the majesty on high. He sits there. And this is what I love about Jesus. He's a risen Savior. And he is in heaven for you. It's, he's not a thought. He's not an idea. He's not a concept. He is a person. And he is alive. And he's at the right hand of God. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But he awakens faith. And then he goes on and says in verse 5, I wait for the Lord. Oh, wait a minute. How many of you are good at waiting? I mean, how many of you are pretty patient people? Oh, yeah, they cut me off. Yeah, Have a good day. <laughs> Oh, you're going 25 miles an hour and it's 50. Oh, I'm fine. I saw Nikki behind me. I don't know she's upstairs. Uh, but I was going to slow down just to aggravate her as she's coming to church. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, she's, she's upstairs, I think. Because uh, I know she would have gotten really aggravated. What's this person doing? And then she would realize it was me. It's like, oh, that pastor, I'm going to get him. <laughs> Um, we don't like wait, patience is allowing someone else's agenda to come before yours how many of you are good at setting your agenda aside setting what you want aside for the benefit of another that, that's I wait what he's saying is okay my agenda isn't going to come uh, now and I realize that what I want what I wish all my hopes and all my dreams, they may not come in the time that I expect them to, but, but I wait. I'm waiting on you. I'm letting you set the agenda for my life. I wait on you, Lord. I wait for you, Lord. And he goes on and says, oh, no, it's not just me. The deepest part of who I am is turning towards you, and I am setting my life so that you set the agenda for me. My soul waits for you. And in his word, in what you say, your promises, which aren't quite yet fulfilled, but you've said it, and that settles it. There's no I believe about it. Have you ever heard, uh, I, uh, you said it, I believe it, that settles it? No. You said it, it's settled. It's It's done. And, and I, I, my, my soul waits for you. I put my hope in you. I trust in you. 
And so, the resurrection not only awakens faith, but it also awakens hope that we can be forgiven. And, and there's a, a dawning of a new day. That what I love about this cross here, we, we had a great time on Wednesday, and uh, we nailed our sins to the cross. When Jesus died, he died for our sins, but it doesn't end there. He not only forgives us of our past, but he gives us a, a hope that directs every step from this point forward. He, he says... Uh, in verse 6, my soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. It's a picture of a city. And this city is shrouded by darkness and, and the watchmen can hear there is a, a danger that is coming upon them. They, there's anxiety. There's an invasion that's coming. And there's great anxiety because they feel threatened and there, uh, there, there, there's great fear that is capturing them because they don't know it's coming, but they're very, very anxious. They don't see it. And he's just saying, I just, I'm waiting for the first slither of light to come so I at least can see what's coming. Have you ever felt that way? You don't know what's ahead, but you feel great, a great sense of anxiety, a great sense of kind of fear overcome you. And because you, you don't know what's ahead. You don't know what it's going to look like. And so this anxiety rises up within you. The resurrection brings hope into play in our lives so that we can look and say, hey, there's a new day coming. Behold, I make all things new. I, I, I continue. I do a lot of counseling. And, I, and I've sat with a lot of people. In fact, this past week, I, I, I held hope in my hands. Literally, I said, I, I know you don't have hope right now, but I have hope for you. And I'm holding this hope for you, so if, when you need it, you can come to me. I have your hope. Have you ever felt like you didn't have hope? Do you know what the God of heaven and earth has done on the cross? I've, I've written hope on my hand in a nail. And I'm holding hope for you. That the past won't hold you down anymore. And no matter what pain, no matter what heartache, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what people have done to you in the past, you will no longer be shaped by what has happened in the past. You are going to be shaped by this incredible, amazing hope, this new day that is rising up in the midst of all the darkness that you experience. This hope is rising up. And so you are shaped by what's ahead, not what is behind. You're my bride. You're, you're my church. You're my son. You're my daughter. And I have made you to shine for all eternity and be shaped by what's ahead. Be shaped by the incredible future that's before you, not by what is behind you. I've released you from the past. And I've given you a new hope and a new future. You're created for newness and for life. And every day you can wake up and say, well, that old day's gone and I got a fresh new day ahead. The resurrection awakens hope in us. We're like a watchman sometimes. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I don't know if any of you were like really anxious this morning. It's like, oh man, it's dark. I sure hope the sun rises. I'm not sure about it. I, oh, oh I, I'm just really anxious. Sunrise, please rise. I mean, did anybody do that this morning? Or did you expect the sun to rise? You, you, your hope was so full of faith that you knew that you knew that you knew that the sun was going to rise. The resurrection 
gives us that kind of faith. That reality begins to settle in on us so that our life is not shaped by what has happened, but who you are and what God has done for you and that you have a new day rising. You're like a watchman and you're waiting. Oh yes, you're anxious. But the sun's going to come up and you know it. <clears throat> There's a new day ahead. They wake up and the tomb is empty. The stone's been rolled away. Jesus is alive. It's a new day. And so, my soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. Yep, it's dark, but the sun is going to rise. He has risen, and he's going to rise again, and I have hope. And he, in verse 7, he turns the corner and says, Oh, Israel, <laughs> would you get this? The God of heaven and earth is going to reveal himself. In the Messiah, he's going to wrap our injured flesh around us. He's going to deliver us from our past. And he's going to rise up and give us a new future. So hope in the Lord. Put your hope in him. Because with the Lord, there is mercy. And with the Lord, there is abundant redemption. Now, what he does is he turns a corner and says... This is who my father is. He is the God of second chances. He redeems. He brings meaning, purpose, and value to that which once was all but darkness. He delivers us from our fears and sets our feet so that we can have hope that we never had before. So the resurrection brings not only faith in our powerless, but not only brings hope in our, in our hopelessness, but also brings love in our despair. Brings love in our despair. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for you. You know why? You were like a diamond that was lost. You were lost in the mud, the muck, the mire. And from your perspective, all you could see was darkness and dirt. But the God of heaven and earth reached down and he lifts up the diamond that you are and says, okay, I'm going to clean you up right now. I want to let you shine in all the glory of who you are because I died to find you. I died to bring you back to my heart. I died because you're more valuable than my son and my son's blood. I am allowing him to take your place so I can bring you peace. So I can bring you back. The resurrection delivers us from despair. I mean, we can say the worst things about ourselves, can't we? I, I would say that at least three-fourths of us, I know who your worst enemy is. You know who it is? And you know, God says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's your closest neighbor? <laughs> you. <laughs> and you don't even allow the Father to love you. You, you don't even forgive yourself. Uh, you know, I, I know there's a balance there because we are sinners, but when we come to Christ, He turns sinners into saints. And we become new creatures in Christ, the oldest God. That doesn't mean that we should be haughty because it's all in Christ. It doesn't mean that we should be proud. If anything, we should be proud of what Jesus has done and who he is and reveal his glory. But, but we should feel that sense of love wrap around us. Romans 5, 8 said, God demonstrated his love towards us in this. While we were yet a sinner, Christ died for us. And that love bled on Calvary's cross. 
but you can't keep a good man down. And that love, when you go to the cross and say, Jesus, please forgive me. I need you to deliver me from all my past. He says yes, but they, he doesn't stop there, does he? He gives us a brand new life, a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit, a life that you become adopted, a new creature in Christ, the old is gone. And in reality, you were made for holiness. You were made to be blameless. Well, I'm not blameless. I mean, you should see what goes on in my head. Well, then let the Holy Spirit do his work. Walk in the Spirit. The more you walk in this love that has been demonstrated for you, the more you're captured by it, you'll be like a son or a daughter that does not do what you do to gain the approval of your father. That's how we do things, isn't it? God, if I need to gain your approval, so I'm going to have to do this, do this, and do this. But what if you're already approved? What if God is like flat out on fire in love with you? No matter who you are. What if, you, what if God feels the same way about you that you do about your kids? And even though they mess up, they're yours. And, and, and what if it's that kind of love? Then it's different, isn't it? This, this, it draws us to a place where, God, you love me, so I will do what you want me to. I love to see a smile. I love to please you. And I, I just do what I do to make you smile. Now I'm going to ask you this question. Do you do what you do to make God smile? Probably you got a love problem. And that love problem goes one or two ways. You might not know the love that was demonstrated on Calvary's cross. And you've been playing games with God. It's called religion. When God's called you to a relationship where you respond to his love and say yes. And that your life becomes a response to his love. And that response is called obedience. And maybe you're not obedient because maybe you've walked away from that love. And maybe you've forgotten how excited you are to make God smile. And to please him. And to say yes to him. So, it's time, isn't it? It's time to let the sun rise in your heart. It's time for us to choose to say yes to Jesus once again. I want you to close your eyes, if you would, please. I want to thank you, Father, that you aren't a dead Savior. And that Jesus is a living Savior. And that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. And we have a high priest. We have someone that we can go to you, Father in heaven. And we have direct access to you. And you call us to hold fast this confession. This is resurrection day. And this day of resurrection, we see that many of us are in the depths of darkness. And you have set us free from the darkness. And you have given us... Uh, that resurrection gives us faith to turn towards you. Gives us hope to, to have a new future and a new hope. And, and gives us a love that completely transforms our life. And Father, if there are some here that have never come to that place where they truly understand what you're calling them to. And, and, and they truly understand this is not, has nothing to do with a religious act. But... Uh, it's a relational act when we cry out to you and say, God, I, I'm in darkness. I feel hopeless. I feel helpless. I don't even like myself. And I don't know what you're doing, but in this message, I know you're doing something. Can you say that in your heart? I know that you're doing something. And Lord, whatever you're doing... I want to let you do it. Now would you say this in your heart too? Lord, forgive me. I really have messed up. And I am tired of living in darkness. I thank you, Jesus, not only for 
you dying on the cross for my sins, but the resurrection. And that resurrection brings the light of faith. And I am by faith opening up myself to you. By faith, I am accepting what you did, Jesus, on the cross. By faith, I am accepting the hope of the resurrection. That a new day is ahead and I'm trusting in you. I'm giving my future to you. I'm giving my past to you. I'm giving my present to you. I'm giving my future to you. I trust in you, Jesus. Lord, forgive me and save me. And if you're a believer that kind of has lost your way, this is time for you to just say, I want to make you smile again. I don't know where I lost sight of your love, but I see it in the resurrection. And I thank you. You, you love me for who I am. And I'm not going to avoid living for you anymore. I'm not going to avoid your word. I'm not going to live in guilt anymore. I'm going to live by faith and obedience to you to make you smile. Forgive me, Lord, for being a half-hearted believer. When you want my whole heart, I'm coming to you right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.